today's reading is Jude verses 5 to 19. Now I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these people, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious ones. Yet when Michael, the archangel, was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they do not understand, and what they do understand by instinct, like rational animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, have plunged into Balaam's error for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. These people are dangerous reefs, um, another way is uh, they are like blemishes. Um, so these people are dangerous reefs. At your love feasts, at your love feasts, as they eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds. Trees in trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. It was about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of the holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are discontented grumblers, living according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you, in the end time, there will be scoffers living without, sorry, there will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the spirit. That is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. If we have not met before, my name is Reino. I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor and also to open up God's word uh, with you this morning. I want to start with some questions. Listen to them. What do you want? What do you want? Let's go a little deeper. What do you ultimately want? What do you ultimately want? And then last question. If I looked at your activity over the last week, will I be able to see this? If I looked at your activity over the last week, Will I be able to see this? You can tuck your answers away. We'll circle back to them later. Last week's intro to the book of Jude done by Lesecho was great. Please catch up if you missed it. Just a reminder because I can't rehash everything that he said. It's a letter written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. It states what Jude wants to talk about. And then after he states what he wants to talk about, he goes into a preaching mode, right? He explains, he reminds, he exhorts, he encourages, and he warns. It's like a sermon in a letter form. It only takes you four and a half minutes to read it. It's short, but very, very powerful. May I remind you, in verses 3 and 4, here's what Jude said, the uh, highlights are mine. He said, I'm appealing to you to contend for the faith. I want you to strive. I want you to work. 
I want you to put in some effort when it comes to your faith. It doesn't come easy and it doesn't come by itself. I need you to work. That's what he says. And he says, I'm, I'm asking you to do this because some people, look at the highlights, are turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ. You've got people who are confusing you. You've got people who are lying to you. And they are lying to you, especially about what you do with your body. Sex is a massive topic. And what you do with your stuff. Money and possessions. And here's the lie. Here's the lie that was told to the church that Jude is writing to. You can do whatever you want. Because God's grace is sufficient to cover you every time. You don't need to put in effort. Don't be so serious about this. My word. Chill. Don't be so extra. You're being a bit heavy. That's a lie. Here's the truth. Effort is not opposed to grace. Earning is. Can I say that again? Effort is not opposed to grace. Earning is. Effort is our response to to God's grace. So let me ask you another question. How much effort did you put in this week in your relationship with Jesus? Think of the questions that I started with. If your ultimate want, right, the second question, is that you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, that you want to grow in your knowledge of the Bible, that you want your life to uh, bear fruit of the Spirit, that you want to grow in prayer, did you put in any effort towards this this week? Jude wants us to put in effort. Jude wants us to fight. And Jude wants us to keep on fighting. Jude encourages us to fight the good fight. Let me give you an illustration. This is a guy walking to the boxing ring. This guy is focused. This guy is all in. I specifically chose this photo of someone going towards the fight because he's leaving stuff behind and he's going to get some business done in there. Extreme focus is needed. He needs to be all in in the ring. And when you are in the ring, there's a whole bunch of things happening at the same time and that is why it requires your focus. As you stand in the boxing ring, you need to remember everything that you taught, uh, that you were taught and that you learned in training. You have to remember all the different things you did to help you box well during a fight. Not only do you remember everything that you've learned, you also have to think ahead in the boxing ring. Trying to figure out how I will eventually beat my opponent. While you are thinking ahead and remembering, you also have to react to whatever it is that your opponent is throwing at you. And while you remember everything you were taught, while you think ahead about how you're going to beat him, while you react to the shots being thrown at you, you also listen to your coach who's in your corner telling you what to do in the fight. You cannot do that if you don't focus. And you cannot do that if you aren't all in in the ring. That's what Jude encourages us to do. All in. Fight. Focus. Question. Is this where you are in your walk with Jesus? Is that your posture? If you're not a believer listening to this sermon, I want you to know that faith in Jesus is an all-in affair. There's no half-baked Christians, at least in the Bible, many of them in this world. But in the Bible, it's either or. You're either in or you're not. And when you're in, you are all in. So how do we fight the good fight? Four things. All of them start with an R. So I'm in trouble today with my nice little abrasive Afrikaans R oh, yeah, but let's go. Remember the gospel. Resist the lie. Reject false teaching. Repent regularly. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to fight the good fight. And we want to do it for your glory, for your honor, 
for your kingdom, for your good news, for your purposes, for your plan, for your name. We know, Lord Jesus, that you called us into this life as your followers. And somehow we forget the gospel. Somehow we believe the lie. Somehow we listen to false teachers. And somehow we find ourselves in a position where we just don't want to repent. Lord Jesus, I want to ask you today to speak to us through this word. And to help us. So that we don't go astray. But that we'll stay in the fight. Focused for you. I want to pray against any distractions that we have at this moment, especially lies festering in our minds and in our hearts. Liberate us from these things, Lord Jesus. Keep us close to you. Let us feel the warmth from the love of your chest as your children. And while we do that, Holy Spirit, we pray that you transform us, do a work in us that only you can do. I pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I said four things. You'll see all four of these play in every section of the letter. Okay? Now, important note here. Jude is not confronting people who are not confessing Christians. This is really important. Jude is not talking to people who do not believe. Jude is also not talking to people who are currently struggling through their faith, who believe and who wants to believe but are really struggling. Jude is confronting people, listen to this, who are false in their teaching and in their conduct. That's it. So you're either not talking the truth or you're not living the truth. And those are the people that Jude is confronting. So let's look at verses 5 to 10. Okay, It'll be up on the screen. And I added some info in here for you to keep track. Because I don't know how many of you had that experience while Muzi was reading but this is a really difficult, it's a difficult letter. And it's packed and it's really, really dense. So let's take it uh, section by section. Now, to help his readers, this is Jude now, resist the influence of false teachers, Jude reminds them that their initial instruction by the apostles, when they got converted and when they got baptized, included teaching about God's judgment, Right? And God's judgment on disbelief and disobedience. So that's where he starts. Now let me show you the highlights in this portion of Scripture. Jude recalls a story in Numbers chapter 14. And that story was that after they were saved out of Egypt, they were later destroyed for not believing. He also recalls the story in Genesis 6 of angels not keeping their own position, but abandoning their proper dwelling. He recalls the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that we find in Genesis chapter 19. He recalls a story that none of you have ever read about in the Bible, because it's not written in the Bible. It's written in a book called The Testament of Moses. I don't know how many of you Bible nerds caught that. Like when you read Jude and you get to chapter 9, verse 9, and you read about Michael the archangel disputing with the devil, any Bible nerd should go, I've never read the story. Because it's actually not in the Bible. It comes from the Testament of Moses. Okay? So he recalls that story. And in all of it, here's what he says in the middle. They were not relying on the law anymore. They were relying on their dreams, on their own ideas, on their own interpretations. They strayed from the truth. They strayed from what they knew and were taught. And what happened to them? Look at verse 10. They were destroyed. That's, in a summary, what this portion is all about. So Jude says, do you remember your story? Jude says to them, you've heard these stories before. Jude says to them, listen to this, truth has a story. Truth has a history. Truth comes from somewhere. Truth is not your truth. It is the truth. Do you get that? I hear people say, I will speak my truth. There is no such thing. There's only the truth. And it comes from somewhere. And that's from God Himself. And Jesus says, I am the truth. So truth is to be found in Him. 
The point of verses 5 to 10 is that these people, right, these four instances, forgot the truth. They didn't listen. And it ended poorly for them. Look at verse 10. Eventually, they were destroyed. Let me use an illustration. Many people text and drive. I just want to say that I never do it. And I also just want to say that I just lied to you because I just can't resist it. <laughs> I got you there for a second. Can you imagine if you picked up your phone while driving and it could say to you, warning, warning, you could possibly be either taking your own life or someone else's life now. Last year in the Republic of South Africa, so many traffic accidents was caused, were caused by uh, texting and driving. So many people died because of texting and driving. Do not text and drive. I shall now go silent. <laughs> Can you imagine if your phone said that to you? Like that would be a phenomenal warning. And most of us would probably listen to the warning because it would be a new function and it would jolt us into clarity or realization that I should not be doing this. Okay. Think about smoking. Every packet of cigarettes has a warning on it. This will kill you. Every bottle of drink has a warning on it. Do not abuse this. It's going to end poorly. Do you think people listen to it? Why? Because we have the ability to become numb to warnings. Because we've had these warnings for a long time. It's been on cigarettes for years. And it's been on drink for years. No one even reads it anymore. So just thinking that a mere warning will help us to listen uh, uh, might be erroneous thinking. Because we get used to them. We become numb to them. My question is, do you hear the warning this morning? And accidentally that just rhymed and it sounded really cool. I said verse 9 is not found in the Bible. It's found in the Testament of Moses. So let me just explain what verse 9 means. Okay? Because if you read it like this, the, Ma Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body. And yet he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said the Lord rebuke you. It's clear, isn't it? Great verse. Let's keep going. No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so Michael, the archangel, is contrasted with the false teachers. Okay, so you get false teachers, and then you get Michael. And in arguing against the lie the devil brought against Moses, and that was accusing Moses of murder, Michael were not was not pretending to be higher than God or the law in any way. Okay, so what he said is he stands on the authority of the name of the Lord, and he said, the Lord rebuke you. So the crux of the message of verse 9 is hashtag be like Michael. Okay, that's why Jude mentions it. Because I mean, we can go down a deep rabbit hole, and you guys know me as a Bible nerd, I would love to go down it, but we're not going to go down there today. But that's what he says, be like Michael. Never exalt yourself higher than God. Never exalt yourself higher than his law. Stand on the authority of his name. Okay. Now I said all four of the ways in which we fight the good fight can be seen in all of these portions of Scripture. Can you see why remembering the gospel is important? Because in all of these instances they forgot. Can you see why resisting the lie is so important? Because in all of these instances they didn't believe that God had his best for them. And that God was in control. And that God was still with them. And that God was going to keep their promises. In all of these instances, they did not reject false teachers. They believed false teachers. Which led them to do things that they, didn't, uh, uh, that they shouldn't have done. And in all four of these instances, they had an opportunity to repent. And they didn't. They kept going. And eventually they were destroyed. Do you see it? Let's look at verses 11 to 13. In this section... Jude focuses on the false teachers as teachers and corruptors of others. Do you see it? And then he says, as they teach and corrupt others, they do exactly what people in the Old Testament did. So they are repeating the cycle of sin in the Old Testament. That is foolish. 
Because sin in the Old Testament ended in judgment. Sin in the New Testament will end in judgment. Do not do it. Okay, so once again. Cain, Genesis 4. Balaam's error, Numbers, chapter 22 to 25. Korah's rebellion, Numbers 16. Okay, so Judah's drawing from the Old Testament. He compares false teachers firstly to Cain. What did Cain do? Cain was a prototype of sinners, right? He murdered his brother. And as he murdered his brother, he taught other people to do it. So he corrupted the race of Adam. Secondly, they are compared to Balaam. Now Balaam is a prophet in the Old Testament, the scripture references up there, who was greedy. And because he was greedy and he wanted financial gain, he hurried to give advice to Israel, which led to an absolute disastrous going astray of the Israelite people. That's also the story where you find a talking donkey. But I won't be talking about the talking donkey this morning. I just want to say, if that rings a bell, that's the story. Thirdly, he says, he compares them to Korah. Now, what Korah did in Numbers chapter 16 is Korah contested the authority of Moses and he disputed the divine origin of God's law. And as he contested Moses' authority and as he disputed the law, he gathered some followers around him, right? And then 14,700 people died. There's a disaster for you. Jude says... False teachers are like these people. And then Jude uses six metaphors to describe them in this section. The first one, dangerous reefs. So if the readers of Jude's letter come too close to them, they risk what? Shipwreck. Because that's what a dangerous reef is. It's hidden beneath the surface. And you can't see it. But when you run into it, you're dead. Jude says these people are like them. And you should watch out. Because they are among you. He says they sit at your love feasts. But you're going to run into them. And you're going to die. Then he calls them shepherds. Who instead of tending the sheep. Look after themselves at the sheep's expense. And how do they do that? By requiring the church to support them at a high standard of living. Oh, fam, this will preach in South Africa. How many pastors in our context live it up, high life, post it and share it for everyone to see, and then they call it hashtag blessed, and then they tell you that God wants to give you the same. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And those teachers are false teachers. Why? Because they use the church to fund that lifestyle. And unashamedly, they would tell the church to give more and give more and give more. For their planes, mansions and fancy schmancy fancy shoes. That is a lie. And Jude says, if you have shepherds who look after themselves at your cost, they are false teachers. Then he uses four more metaphors, all drawn from nature, one from each region of the universe. Do you see it? It's quite clever. I mean, let's give it up for Jude. He talks about the air, talks about the earth, talks about water, talks about the heavens. And each example that he uses, or each metaphor that he uses, is a metaphor of nature failing to follow the laws that was ordained for her. Do you see it? So, in this lawlessness of nature, Jude sees pictures of the lawlessness of the false teachers of the last days. Here's what Jude says. The evidence is out there. If you don't follow the script... If you don't follow God's design, if you don't follow the laws that He laid down, it's going to end poorly. Because those are the metaphors that He uses. So from clouds to trees, fruitless, twice dead, uprooted, 
wild waves, wandering stars, all examples of created things not following God's will. And what Jude calls the people's attention to is the evidence is out there. Open your eyes. See what disaster can come from it. And then stay in your lane. It's really not that difficult, fam. Any parent in the house would tell you that when they tell their kids, this is what you need to do now, it is because this parent knows that that's, what, that that's what's best for the kid. And you know where it goes well in your house? is when your kids obey. Because then everyone wins. <laughs> do you know how it goes poorly in your house? is if your kid somehow goes into Korah's rebellion and they just don't want to do what you tell them to do. I mean, I'm mentioning families and parenting now because it's something that we feel in our own bodies. Like we see it daily. Even if you don't have your own family, you see it from others. So the first of these two nature images, the clouds, they fail to give rain. The trees, they fail to provide fruit. They make the same point. Check this, and that is, despite the claims that the false teachers make about the so-called value of their teaching, the false teachers are of no benefit to the church at all. Do you see that? Great teaching. And they can tell you how important this teaching is. It'll bear no fruit. It will go nowhere. It's of no benefit to the church. And then, in the other example about the waves, just like the turbulent sea throws up filth on the shore, these false teachers actually have a harmful effect on the church. They make the church dirty. Why? Because they corrupt those who come under their influence. And finally, as they are compared to the stars which go astray from God's ordained courses, it's all about misleading those who look to them for guidance. Have you guys ever heard of the Southern Cross and other things in the stars that we can use for navigation and leading? What Jude says is, in the same way that we need that stuff to stay in the same place so that we can get direction, False teachers mislead you and they misguide you as if the stars would be moving. Do you see it? That's what he says. Now fam, many of Jude's readers definitely found the false teachers impressive and persuasive. They did. That's why they listened to them. And part of Jude's task is to shift the imagination of his people so that they can see the false teachers in a whole new light. Can you see that? That's why he uses all these rich imagery. Okay, so how do we fight this? Well, we fight this in the four ways that we mentioned. Remembering the gospel, resisting the lie, rejecting false teaching, and repenting. Okay, let's look at verse 14 to 16. So Jude quotes from another source outside of the Bible, from the book of Enoch. It was a respected book. It was a well-known book. In today's language, we call it an apocryphal. We call it an apocryphal book. <laughs> a book that's important for our faith, but it's not in the canon of the Bible. It's not in the selection or the range of the books of the Bible. Now, in quoting Enoch, this is probably, I think, Jude's key text in this whole commentary, explanation, and sermon, and exhortation that he's currently preaching. Why? Because it speaks of the coming of the Lord Jesus to judge the wicked. It's one of Jude's main points. Jesus Christ, our Lord, will come and he will judge the wicked. And then he says, in an emphatic way, what these wicked people do. And that is the repetition of the word ungodly. Do you see how many times? I mean, I highlighted them for you ungodly, 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 and ungodly. Like you don't have to guess who God's judgment is for. Those who indulge in ungodly conduct, as the false teachers do, are those on whom judgment will fall. Can you see why the four ways we mentioned, how to fight the good fight, are so important? Think of the questions in the beginning when I asked you what do you ultimately want. None of you answered with what I ultimately want is to fall under the judgment of God. Right? That's not a hashtag life goal for anyone. But Jude says that's where you end up. 
if you participate in ungodly conduct. Let's look at verses 17 to 19. So what Jude is doing in 17 to 19 is he's pretty much summarizing what is called the apostles' teaching, right? So Jesus is discipled, turned apostles, and they were seen as the authoritative teachers in the early church in that first part of the growth of the church and also um, uh, uh, the spread of the church, the spread of the good news. And Jude says, I mean, you, can't be, you won't be able to quote word for word what Jude says from the other apostles' teaching. But here's what Jude says. Guys, remember that the apostles predicted that in the final, final period of history, there will be enemies of true religion and the morality in the church. And I mean, we can nod to that, right? If you read the Apostle Paul, if you read the Apostle Peter, if you read the Apostle John, you'll see these. In the final period of history, there will be enemies of true religion and morality in the church in the church. Fam, in which part of history are we now? We are in the final part of history of the church. The only thing that's left is restoration, redemption, and the end that's the beginning for all of us. That's where history is headed. Which means that if the apostles said there'll be enemies of true religion and morality in the church in this period, we have those today. Can I be honest with you? The way that we make sure that we are not enemies of true religion and morality in this church is our two distinctives that we read every single Sunday. We are a gospel-centered church. We are a disciple-making church. So if we stick to the gospel and we teach the gospel and we remember the gospel and we herald the gospel and we live the gospel and we embody the gospel and we remind each other of the gospel, we won't be an enemy of true religion. And the same is true for disciple making. We say that as the gospel transforms the individual life of a person, we want to see a multiplying effect of that. We want you to grow. We want to see how you become more mature in your faith, how you get shaped into the image of Christ, how your life bears fruit of the Spirit, how you become a testimony to God's goodness and love and grace in this world. Which means these are like guardrails for us. That's why we read them every single Sunday. That's why we remind each other of them every single Sunday. Because we can't be an enemy of true religion or morality in the church in the final period of history. The stakes are too high. It's going to end in destruction. And even more for us as leaders. The Bible says we'll be held to a higher account. <laughs> I stand here in fear and trembling. Because what I say to you every single week is a matter of life and death. I have to get it right. It's not like a recipe that you can get wrong and then go, oh, we'll try a new one. If I teach you lies, you're going to die. But on the other hand, oof, how sweet is this? If I teach you the gospel, you are going to live. And it starts now and it lasts into eternity. And it is the abundant life that only God himself gives through his son, Jesus Christ. We are very serious about this. In this church. We are unified around the gospel. We are unified around disciple making. We want to keep on discovering. We want to keep on deepening. And we want to do it together. Jude's warning in 17 to 19. Is that this will be true in the time you live in. Same warning counts for us today. How do we fight the good fight? Let's recap. We remember the gospel. Fam, listen to me. You never graduate from the gospel. Never. <laughs> it's too powerful. It's too rich. It's too awesome. And it is too beautiful. Listen to me now. The gospel has the power to save anybody from anything at any time. And it can break anything. It can pay anything. That's the gospel. The mercy of God in the gospel. The feeling and the experience of amazing grace. Oh, how sweet the sound. The hour I first believed. 
the love of God that was revealed to you in that moment when you took your leap of faith, when you said, I believe that this counts for me, the peace that you first received when you believed in Christ Jesus and you were forgiven for your sin, do not forget this. Remember it every single day, not only on Sundays. Like you have to remember it tonight, you have to remember it tomorrow morning, and tomorrow afternoon, and tomorrow night, and everywhere in between. You can marvel at it. You should marvel at it every single day. Faith is a gift that is given to us. God wanted to reconcile himself to humankind because he created them to be in relationship with them. Sin broke that relationship. God wanted to fix it. He sent His Son. His Son lived the perfect life in our place, died the death that we should have died, was raised from the dead, so He became the first one to enter into this whole new mode of life. And now that's possible for all of us. That is the good news. And God gives it to us as gift, and then we grip it. You have to take it. You have to decide. You have to take a leap of faith. And with that leap of faith, you take a grip on this gift that God has given you. And if you do, it will change everything. Every single person in this place who has come to faith will tell you it changed everything. And this person standing here now speaking to you will tell you that it changed everything. That's the gospel. We should never forget it. Remember the gospel. Second one, resist the lie. Fam, Adam and Eve's sin came from the devil questioning their belief in God. Did God say? And the word of God has been under fire ever since that moment. And the question that you and I have, if we want to resist the lie, is do you believe God? Do you believe Him? Because if you do, and the enemy comes with doubt and lies, then you rebuke the enemy by quoting back to him God's Word. That's what Jesus did when He was tempted by the devil. And stating and saying, I believe God. I sent you this quote on Friday. I don't know how many of you read it on the news group. It's a quote from Ryan Britt. He's a pastor in, at the Church of 1122 in Jacksonville, Florida. He says, The enemy's goal is to suppress the truth that God loves you because if you believe and receive that He does, it changes everything. Fam, I love you from God is the loudest with Jesus on the cross. Like, there you go. That's your evidence. Does God really love me? Yes, Look at Jesus on the cross. Will God make good on His promises? Yes. Look at Jesus on the cross. Does God care for me? Yes. Look at Jesus on the cross. Don't be led into the lie. Resist the lie. By looking at Jesus on the cross. That's your evidence. That He loves you. We should never doubt that. Resist the lie. Reject false teachers. I want to ask you one question. Well, two questions, but it's really one question. Who do you give your ears to? Let me ask it in a more simple form. What comes into your ears every day? Let me put this to you. Recent report from the Electronics Hub. It was done in July 2023. Come on now, fresh stats. Ooh, I myself, I love a little bit of fresh research. South Africans spend 58.2% of their day in front of screens. South Africans spend 22.5% of their days scrolling social media. A total of 9 hours and 38 minutes minutes daily on screens. This counts for everything. Computers as well. Five hours and 13 minutes on phones. Three hours and 44 minutes 
on social media. Three hours and 44 minutes on social media. Do you know how long it takes to read Jude? Four and a half minutes. <laughs> Did you read Jude this week? Because according to the stats, you had a lot of time. And I just put the gaming one in there for the gamers. Okay? They did do research on gaming. You guys know how I feel about social media. I'm not going to put it on the stage and bash it now, because I always bash it. I want to ask you one question. Is this harmful to your walk with Jesus? Listen to my question. Is this harmful to your walk with Jesus? Because that's coming into your ears every single day. You are lending your ears to those people. I'm not saying it's all bad, but I promise you that there are false teachers on there. Last one. Repent regularly. Guys, when you repent, you turn. That's what you do. I'm headed this way. I realize in light of the truth it's the wrong way. And then I turn and I head in the opposite direction. And the opposite direction is always back to the Father, always back to God, always back to His mercy, always back to His love, always back to His forgiveness. Regularly. Did you hear that? Not back at the student camp where I got saved. Or last year when I lost it once with the kids. Every day. Regularly. Paul uses the word metanoia. Meta means outside. Nous means mind. He says you have to get a new brain. That's what repentance means. Come to a new mind. Renew your head. Start over. Because there's something that made you go down this path. Get it out. Turn and start thinking anew. Start over. In light of the truth. How often are we convicted of our sin? Are we convicted of heading down a certain way? But then we don't change our minds about that way. We just change our little plans about how we're going to navigate this way. That doesn't work. Repenting means starting over. Think of the boxing metaphor that I spoke about earlier. When you stand in the ring and you get thumped on the nose, do you know what that does to you? I actually did boxing once in my life. Well, for a period in my life. Do you know what that does? The moment you get hit on the nose, poof, it calls you into a reset. Because in that moment, you realize that what I'm busy with is not helping. <laughs> like, I think I'm doing the right thing. I think I'm on the nose. And then you go, okay, wait, start over, start over. Legs, balance, hand, save, listen, check. Like, you reset to that position the whole time when you box. That's what repentance does. Is you get hit on the nose by sin. That jolts you into reality. You repent from it and then you start over. How often do we do that? Repenting regularly will keep you humble. Repenting regularly will keep you teachable. Repenting regularly will keep you dependent on God's grace. Repenting regularly will lead to renewal of your soul and your life. We need to repent regularly. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we sang earlier today that your mercy is more. Oh, and how rich the love is that you lavished on us. And how comprehensive and final and complete your forgiveness are for us. Lord Jesus, we don't want to forget that. We want to remember the gospel. We want to remember the price you paid. We want to remember the love that you showed to us. And we want to respond to that grace by putting in every effort we possibly can. Lord Jesus, we believe lies. And we admit that. And those lies lead us astray. 
And somehow, because we find false teachers so persuasive, we don't resist them, we listen to them. And it ends in destruction. Lord Jesus, we don't want to do that. We want to fight the good fight. And therefore, we are willing to repent this morning. Whatever it is that you awaken in our hearts now, I pray that we would have the courage to repent from it, to turn from it, to come to a new mind, to start over, to think anew, so that we can find our way back to you. When we sing King of my heart now, Lord Jesus, I pray that we wouldn't only get that warm feeling now in this worship service, but that we'll get this tomorrow morning when we have to wake up and go to work. Tomorrow when we sit in a boardroom or in a meeting. Tomorrow when we drive on our roads. Tomorrow when the power goes off because of load shedding. Tomorrow when people disappoint us and hurt us. Tomorrow when you called us uh, to do something sacrificial for someone or to give generously. Tomorrow when your spirit asks us to obey you and commands us to do what you would have us do. I want the chorus, King of my heart, to be in our being then as well. So Lord Jesus, when we sing this now, may it seep deep, deep into our hearts because this is what we believe. And that is that you are the King of our hearts. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen.